When Karen and I were dating, and believe it or not, that would be 50 years this fall. <laughs> we saw the, the movie together, Fiddler on the Roof, um, for the first time. We've seen it many times since. And we've had this long-standing debate ever since we first saw the film. Um, in case you don't remember, and even if you do, it's, it's a movie about a poor Jewish family living in Russia at the end of the 19th or early 20th century. And the head of the household is Reptevia, and he and his wife have three daughters, and they need to find husbands for their wife, for their, for their children. Um, the youngest one is a bit young for marriage yet, but that day's coming. So Reptevia and his wife arrange a marriage for their oldest daughter first with Laser Wolf. And Laser Wolf is a rich butcher who is about 30 years older than their oldest daughter. But he's rich, and he's a good man, and he's Jewish. To their surprise, they learn that their oldest daughter has actually become secretly engaged already. She's engaged to a poor Jewish tailor. I mean, the guy is a bit of a wimp, and he's penniless. But they love each other. So Reptevia and his wife reconcile themselves to their firstborn marrying a poor <laughs> Jewish tailor. The second daughter meets a Jewish Bolshevik who has joined the, the movement to overthrow the Russian Tsar and his government. And although Reptevia doesn't quite agree with all of his politics, he's still a good Jewish boy. So Reptevia and his wife give their blessing to the second marriage. Their third daughter meets a, a Russian Gentile soldier who is stationed in the village. They both love books. He's a kind and good-looking guy. They fall in love and they want to marry. And she asks her father for his blessing. And it is not an easy decision for Reptevia. Um, perhaps you can already anticipate the argument between Karen and I. Um, should Reptevia give his blessing or no? And Reptevia does not give his blessing. In fact, from that marriage time, he considers this daughter dead to him. He has no third daughter. And that issue is never resolved throughout the whole movie. What, what I want you to understand and feel is that this story describes a very real tension that was created by God himself. When God called Abraham and entered into a covenant with him, he created a distinction between the Hebrews, that is the descendants of Abraham, and the Gentiles, all other non-Jewish people. To Abraham and his physical descendants, God said, I will be your God, and you shall be my people. That distinction was, was um, codified in ordinances in the law covenant that God made with them at Mount Sinai. And by the first century, by the way, during at the time Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, those distinctions were battlegrounds between Jews and Gentiles. You know, the, the problem is that we are quite separated from feeling that, that, that separation. Uh, we're, 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 we're separated 2,000 years from feeling that separation. And that makes it a challenge to, to understand the identity gap that Paul is describing in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. And I'll, I'll invite you just to turn to that passage if you're not there already. 
And here's the reason why this passage is here in the Bible. This passage, uh, as we read it carefully, this passage will help us to understand that conflict that we've been describing and how Jesus changed it all. So, the, the message of this passage is that there are two things that we need to remember today. That's what Paul is saying in this, this paragraph. And I'll just tell you what the two things are up front. We need to remember our old identity when we were far from God. And I'll, I'll, we'll look at that in verses 11 and 12. And we also need to remember our new identity in Christ, which Paul unpacks in verses 13 through 22. So let's, let's consider the first thing to remember. We need to remember our old identi identity when we were far from God. Let, let's just read verses 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the, hand, in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. We can summarize our old identity in three statements from, from, from these two verses. The, the first is this, that we were the uncircumcised. I get that from verse 11. When God made a covenant with him, when he, when he added an addendum to that covenant, just a few chapters after Genesis 12, he also added circumcision to that covenant as the sign of that covenant. All the male heirs of, of all the male descendants of Abraham were to be circumcised. And that was a practice that was codified, codified also in the, the Mosaic Covenant that God made with Israel at Sinai. And this name calling that's going on between Hebrews and Jews, the circumcised, the uncircumcised, that's act, those are actually insults of derision that they spoke to one another. Paul doesn't say very much about that, except he says one thing. He says, that's a rite that is performed by human hands in the flesh, which is a way of emphasizing that's a physical thing carried out just simply by a human being. Now, remember, he's just been talking about all that God has done for us in Christ in the previous paragraph. That's a work of the Spirit of God and of God Himself. Circumcision, it's a human act. The second statement we can, we can use to summarize what's going on here is that we were a people separated from Christ. And I get that from verse 12. Separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. I'm going to put those two things together. This is not a statement about our personal spiritual condition. That's what we were looking at in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. We're looking at our personal spiritual condition in the past, who we were by nature. This is not talking about your personal spiritual condition. It's talking about who we were as a corporate uh, identity as Gentiles. And that is that we were not connected to the people through whom God intended to send the Christ into the world. It's not so much that we didn't, that we didn't know about the Christ. It's that we simply were, we were disconnected from that Christ and the people from whom he would arise. And because of that, we are alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Aliens. Um, 
Probably most of us in this room have never had the experience of actually feeling like an alien. If you have, you probably understand and feel Paul's language here more than, than most of us. Um, I was privileged to live the life of an alien for nine years in Africa, in the city of Lusaka, Zambia. Karen and I both did. And in 2018, I had an experience which very much made me feel my alien status. In 2017, while I was here in the United States, my work visa had expired. No problem. I'll go to Zambia. When I arrive, I, they will note that my work visa has, has expired, that they will have that information. And they will set me set, they'll set me on the course of renewing that work visa, making it new, and everything will be okay. Except that when I arrived in Zambia and stepped up to the window to speak with the immigration officer, in three minutes' time he informed me that I was an illegal alien in Zambia. They had changed the law the year before wasn't even in the form that I had previously filled out to hand to that immigration officer, but they had changed the law so that I did not have the permission of the Zambian government to come to Zambia while my work permit was in process. I had to stay out of the country. And guess what? That plane's gonna fly out in just a few minutes and I'm not gonna be on it and I'm gonna be here illegally. So they, they told me, go sit over there. It wasn't a jail cell, but it was a detention area where those who were in some kind of violation would have to go and sit. And so I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm waiting. I have friends outside waiting to receive me um, and help me. And I sat there for two hours before anyone would even come, an immigration officer would even come and speak to me. And when he did speak with me, it was not a nice experience. <laughs> I was threatened with incarceration, that I would have to perhaps even spend the night in, the, in, a, in a jail cell there at the airport. And I, I didn't, I had never seen that jail cell, but I was pretty sure it wasn't gonna be a nice place. <laughs> The next morning, I actually found out that was true because another person who was an illegal alien who was sitting with me, also going to be interviewed, long story short, they allowed me to leave the airport and come back the next morning at 8 a.m. They put him in the jail cell. And when I saw him the next morning, he was a devastated human being, I'll tell you. Uh, he told me about the conditions. Eight by eight cell, six people, no chairs, no bed, no place to use a bathroom facility, no place to lay down, no place to even sit down. And they spent the night, all of them, standing among their own human refuse in the jail cell. That's what can happen when you're an alien. You really do not have the rights of a citizen of that country. And that's the point that Paul is making here. We do not have the rights of a Hebrew man or woman who is a citizen of the commonwealth that God entered into covenant with. The third summary statement is that we were strangers to the covenants of promise. And I get that from verse 12. Strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Strangers to the covenant doesn't mean so much that we didn't know about the promise in God's covenant. It means that we didn't share in that promise through physical descent from Abraham. So it's, it's actually, again, emphasizing their, the alien condition of what I assume is every person in this room, a Gentile. 
If there's some Jewish people here, please forgive me. Uh, so the summary of our old condition, our identity away from, apart from Christ, was that we were in a spiritual dead end, a spiritual cul-de-sac, and we're going nowhere. We were Christless, no connection to the Messiah. We were stateless, no citizenship in the country that really matters. We were godless, no true God to help us and represent us. We were hopeless. We had no future. Do you feel the, the distance between Jews and Gentiles that Paul is describing here? Are you starting to get a feel for that? The more you feel that distance, the more you will glory in the reconciliation that Christ has accomplished. Just as, the, just as the more desperately sick person sees more wonderfully the remedy that is provided and the physician who applies it, so too God's grace will be even more wonderful to us if we can, we can get into this mindset that Paul is describing of who we were before the coming of Jesus. The second thing that we need to remember is our new identity in Christ from verses 13 through, through 22. In these verses, take, Paul, Paul takes up the truth of, the, of, of how God has changed all of that previous identity for us. And the hinge of this paragraph is those two words in verse 13, but now. Um, this is parallel with the hinge of the previous paragraph in those two words of verse 4, but God. You see the parallel between them. But now introduces a new age in God's program that gives Gentiles who believe in Jesus a new identity. And the new identity is based upon Christ and our union with Him. But now in Christ, in Christ, Paul says. Let's read verses 13 through 22. But now in Christ, Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility. And he, he came and preached peace to, to you who were far off, that's Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, that's Jews. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is a passage that is rich in metaphors to help us get the message and help us understand and feel this huge difference and the wonder of what God now has done. Paul uses four metaphors to describe the change in our identity. The first metaphor is that there's a metaphor of, of distance, nearness, Farness. Um, we were far off from God, but now have been brought near to Him. 
Those are wonderful words of encouragement. We sang them. We sang about them this morning. That we've been, we've been brought near. When we think about being brought near, we think in terms of having access, of being close, of being able to meet important persons. Um, I've never met or seen uh, a, a president of the United States face to face. Forrest Gump apparently met everyone while he was living. <laughs> um, and we, we see that about his life portrayed in, in the movie, uh, uh, that fiction, fictional movie about his life. And we, you know, we're, we're amazed and impressed. This man met presidents. What Paul is saying here is that you and I have the privilege of entering into the very presence of the most important person in the universe, Amen. God himself. We've been brought near. Secondly, there's a metaphor of conflict. We were in a state of hostility to God, but now we are at peace. In our old identity, we were not in a state of detente. I don't know how many of you remember detente. It was a policy that was developed in, I think, probably the 70s and early 80s with the Russian government, ruling powers there, in which we basically agreed that we were not going to be hostile, acting hostile or aggressively toward one another. There was detente. We were going to cease those kind of activities that brought about, that could bring about conflict. Folks, we were not in a state of detente with God. In our new identity, though, we've been brought into a place of peace with God. God is at peace with us. There is shalom. There's wholeness and well-being. The third metaphor is a metaphor of, of citizenship. Paul says we were aliens, but now we are fellow citizens in God's kingdom. In God's new program in Christ, we are no longer second-class citizens, but citizens in God's kingdom with the full rights and privileges of his people because the king is our advocate. Praise God. Fourthly, there's a metaphor of family. We were fatherless, but now we are members of God's household. When Karen and I lived in Mount Morris, we had a home on Center Street. It's actually the parsonage. And um, that, the parsonage had two large picture windows in the two front rooms of the house facing the, the street. And I actually enjoyed going out in the evening um, after nightfall had, had come and with the, with the lights in the house on and those two windows still open, it was just there was something very warm and welcoming looking, standing out on the sidewalk and looking into our, our house. And I remember imagining specifically, what would it feel like to an orphan? standing here on the sidewalk, looking inside. What would it feel like to an orphan? Um, that orphan might look inside at dinner time and he'd see the family gathered around the table. He'd see the father and the mother speaking and having conversation with the children. And he might, that orphan, he or she might very much want to to enter into that, just to, to be a part of that, because well, he or she is an orphan. They don't have that kind of experience. What, what Paul is saying here is that, in a, in a very real sense, we were like orphans on the outside. And God came to the front door, opened that up, and not only invited us to come in and eat at the table, 
but he invited us as orphans to be a part of his family. That's who we are and what Jesus has done for us. Um, wow, that's a powerful metaphor, isn't it? Helps us to understand and know what, what Christ has done for us. Let me just make three, uh, a couple of brief observations about those metaphors. These metaphors are intended to encourage us to, to know and feel that God has opened the way for us in his son, Jesus Christ. It was right in the line of one of those songs we sang. Uh, Welcome to his table. Um, I, I don't remember it exactly. Welcome to his table. Once you're enemy. Now, One, seated, now seated at your table. Once you're, once we were enemies, now we're seated at his table, and he's he's feeding us, he's waiting upon us himself, and having conversation with us. Um, these metaphors are intended to make us draw near to God. It reminds me of Hebrews four sixteen. Let us then with confidence. Draw near to the throne of grace. Why? That we may receive grace and help in time of need. That we may find mercy. Secondly, these metaphors point to our, our new corporate identity. These, this paragraph and these descriptions are not focused on your individual relationship to the Lord. They're actually not doing that. It's, they're focused on us as the church. It's, it's focused on Christ church and every other true local church that's worshiping the Lord this day around the world. It's, it's talking about our, our corporate identity as the, the church of Jesus Christ and the new people of God. The people of God in, in which now Jew and Gentile have been joined together in one body as the family of God. Together, we draw near to God. Together, we are at peace with God. Together, we are the citizens of this new kingdom being ruled by King Jesus. Together, we are the family of God. God has redirected us out of the spiritual deadness, out of that spiritual dead end, out of that cul-de-sac. And brothers and sisters, we are on the pathway to paradise together. That's who we are now. We need to ask, how did that happen? How is that possible? What, brought, what brought about this transformation of identity? In one word, the answer is Jesus. That's the one word answer. Paul describes him, though, in verse 20, as the cornerstone of this new community of God. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. A cornerstone is the, the symbolic stone at the corner of a building that tied the walls together and upon which Symbolically, the structural integrity of the building depended. This is a way to say that Jesus is the key to the identity of the new people of God. Without him, this wouldn't happen. Jesus, in all his work and in all his personhood as God and man, is the cornerstone. But there is one event that is crucial to the transformation of our identity. And that is the death of Jesus on the cross. Verse 13. Brought near, he says, by the blood of Christ. What happened at the cross to change our identity? What happened at the cross to change our identity? Well, again, let me summarize what Paul says in three statements. <clears throat> the first statement is this, that Jesus' death 
broke down the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles. I get that from verse 14 and 15. He calls this the dividing wall of the law of commandments contained in ordinances. And Paul is very clear what he's talking about there. Jewish and Gentile people would have understood this. Perhaps maybe even better of the first century, perhaps even better than, than we would. He's talking about the covenant God made with his people at Mount Sinai through the mediator Moses. In Romans 7, now that, that sets up, when he says that, even using those words, that sets up a tension, perhaps, in our minds. In Romans 7, Paul says that the law of God, referring again to that, that Mosaic covenant, the law of God is good and righteous and holy. How can he speak of it here as abolished? And in some sense, the enemy that created hostility. Here's my answer to that. I, I, if, you, if that's in your head, I hope this helps you. There's nothing bad about the law of God. There's nothing bad about that covenant. Its purpose was to superintend the life of the Jewish people until the promise of God was fulfilled in sending the Christ into the world. And folks, God's, God's always, God's plan was not, all, not just to send the Christ into the world to save the Jewish people, but from the very beginning, His plan was to send the Christ into the world to save the whole world. That's why God spoke those words that Paul says are the words of the gospel when he said to you, when he said to Abraham, in you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Folks, the families of the earth are Gentiles like you and I. So God had a purpose and a plan. From the very beginning, his plan was that through the Jewish people, the gates would be thrown wide open to all who will call upon him for mercy and grace. And salvation. This wasn't just. This wasn't a, 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 a an afterthought that God had in the person of His Son. It was the plan from the beginning that He would do this. But here's this covenant, and this covenant that guided and superintended His people pretty much puts us in the place of second-class citizens. That covenant was a shadow of the reality that God would create in Christ. It was always picturing the Christ who was going to come and what he was going to do. And now that Jesus has come and fulfilled that covenant, he's fulfilled the law, that covenant is rendered obsolete to govern his people. We are no long, we're no longer relating to God under the terms of that covenant. Folks, if that weren't true, Paul could not say, as he does in, in, in Galatians, that circumcision is nothing. That's what he says. It's nothing. It, it was not nothing in the Mosaic covenant or to Abraham's descendants. It was not nothing. But in the establishment of a new covenant, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of God, God has put us under the jurisdiction of that covenant. And now, circumcision is nothing. But the new birth is everything. <clears throat> and the weakness of that old covenant was that the, the people of God, they were, they were the people of God by physical descent, by birth. But being born doesn't give you a new heart. A heart of faith and hope and trust in God. And that's why their history, that covenant lacked that most important and necessary thing. And when God prophesied through Jeremiah, of a new covenant that he was going to establish, guess what? I'm going to put my law 
in their hearts. Not, not, a, not a descent and citizenship by physical descent, but by spiritual rebirth, by spiritual new birth. So the law was good, and it had a good purpose. But its function to govern and guide, its, its function as jurisdiction over the, the people of God, it, it, it's passed away. It's, it's passed away. I can illustrate it like this. Um, when I lived in Zambia, I was under the jurisdiction of Zambia laws. And it doesn't matter what America's laws say. I had to do what their law said. And, but I'm not there anymore. I'm here. And that law in Zambia no longer has jurisdiction over my life. In a similar way, the Mosaic Covenant no longer has jurisdiction over our lives. Now, this, the, the Mosaic Covenant is good. And we learn so much about the character and nature of God and even the life of faith. But there is much there that no longer directly applies to us as the new people of God in Christ. Um, well, that was just unpacking the first statement. Jesus broke down the dividing wall. Let's unpack the second statement. Jesus' death reconciled a hostile relationship. And I get that from verse 16. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. You know, perhaps it might be natural to think of this hostility as our hostility toward God. We were the rebels. But the hostility actually moves in two directions. Because the reconciliation moves in two directions. We need to be reconciled to God, but there's something perhaps even more important about the statement that God must be reconciled to us. It's a scary thing to read some of the things that God says in his attitude and heart towards, towards sinners. God is angry with the wicked every day, the psalmist says. Now, I don't know how that that can exist in God and at the same time, in God, there is this truth, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is far more complicated, folks, than we are. Let's just say that. Both those things exist in him at the same time. And he has accomplished the reconciliation. It's his plan. It's his purpose. He sent the Son to do it. And Jesus has done it. And now he preaches peace to Jews and Gentiles. The third statement is in verse 18. At least I get it from verse 18. There is, there is one other way that Jesus has changed our, and our identity and is building and is building a new temple. Um, this third statement is, I, I realize it's sounding a little bit more vague because it didn't happen at the cross, but it happened because of the cross. It's mentioned in verse 18. Look at verse 18. In some ways, verse 18 is kind of a summary of the whole paragraph. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And again, in verse 22, in him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the spirit. You see, it's not only by the death of Jesus that this is happening. It's being made effectual in history, in time. In, in space, where we live, where humankind lives, by the working of the Holy Spirit. You know, it, it strikes me what a beautiful and powerful Trinitarian statement this is in verse 18. Through him, that's through Christ, we both have access in one spirit, the Holy Spirit, 
to the Father. That's the Father. The, the, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all at work to make us the new people of God. Jesus not only chose and trained apostles and prophets in his lifetime, but he sent them out to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think that's what Paul means when he he preached when Christ preached to those who were far away. He didn't preach to us, but he sent apostles and prophets to us. And he, he especially sent those apostles and prophets to record scripture. And through scripture, we have access to their witness, to their testimony. Folks, the reason why I'm a Christian, the reason why you are a Christian is because you believe the testimony that the apostles are telling the truth. That Jesus is the Son of God, the Lord and the Savior. That's why saying the Apostles' Creed is important. We're saying that we believe the witness that they have given. Well, that's who we are. Let me just take the time that I have left, a few minutes, to talk about... Um, how should this get fleshed out in our lives? This is a wonderful truth. But how does it get fleshed out? What are the practical ways to work out Paul's instru instructions? You know, in, in chapter 4, he's be going to begin the practical sec section of the book of Ephesians. In chapter 4, there's a definite shift change toward more practical issues. In, the, in our lives, in the life of the church. And so in one sense, this, this is foundational. This paragraph, all of one and two, is kind of foundational for what he's going to say there. But let's just think about it being useful for us. He told us to remember. Uh, how do we go about remembering something that's important? You know, I, I answered that question by thinking about my marriage. I mean, marriage relationship is important, right? Obviously. And we have an anniversary date to remember. That's really a good thing, isn't it? Um, but you know what? If, if the importance of your marriage is only remembered on your anniversary, you have a problem. <laughs> your marriage has a problem. It's, importantly to con it's important to continually refocus on the important things in a marriage. And in the same way, the way that we remember these things that Paul has reminded us about, is, is, is it's important for us to refocus on the important things in our new spiritual identity. Right, here's three ways to help us focus. Uh, Let's just draw out the analogy of marriage. In marriage, we devote time to thinking about marriage and considering how to improve it. So.